Hello. Let's see. There we go. Hey, welcome. Welcome to this uh, History Chats this afternoon. Um, yeah, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes here in about uh, at 12.30, as always. Uh, but we're going to leave the, the door open here for people to join us uh, for a couple minutes. If you're watching this later um, as a recording, feel free to just skip ahead about four minutes, and that'll get you to the program. Um, yeah, in the meantime, I'm just going to just take care of some... Bear with me here. I'm going to go close the door. All right. Yeah, well, thanks. People are starting to join. Great. I'm excited to share this uh, story here this afternoon with you. Um, yeah, Bennett Moulter. We're going to start a, a, a new theme. We, we finished up last week uh, with our October theme of uh, more people you should know. Um, and this week we are embarking on a, a version of that, veterans you should know. And we're going to start with uh, Bennett Moulter here. Um, you know what? I don't think I put that in there. All right, hold on. Troubleshooting live. I've definitely oh, just kind of vamping here as we wait. Um, but I did forget to put something in, so I'm going to do that real quick here. Bear with me. There we go. Great. Okay. So, yeah, again, we're going to get started here in just a second. Um, while we're waiting, um, as always, thanks to our sponsor, Yankee Bookstore, uh, for uh, sponsoring History Speaks and History Chats this year. Um, opportunities for sponsorships coming up next year. We're starting to look into that. So uh, if, you're, if you're somebody who would be interested in, you know, has, has an in with a local company or something and you want to help support local history, um, more on that soon. Um, and in the meantime, hey, if you're if you're uh, watching this, you enjoy these programs, and you're not already a, a member of the Marathon County Historical Society, well, you should do that. Um, it's a pretty reasonable uh, cost. You get membership and all sorts of benefits from um, uh, the becoming a member, and uh, yeah, you get to support local history, and that's always great. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, feel free to to visit our website, marathoncountyhistory.org, or you know. Come on by, give us a call. Uh, we are now open to our regular um, hours. Okay. All right. You know, I think I'm going to get started. It's a little bit of a delay. I'm going to get started um, right now here. Hi. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about Bennett Moulter. Um, as, as I mentioned kind of at the, at the beginning, just a quick overview, he is a World War I flyer uh, with a very interesting story. Um, and uh, I'm excited to, to get into it. Um, I guess we can start with World War I. Um, so World War I, in, the, in uh, April of 1917, the United States finally declares war after a lot of... of sort of tension of whether we're going to be neutral in this, this European war that's been waging since 1914, so for about three years. Uh, finally, um, President Wilson gets approval from the, um, uh, the legislature, the, the, the Congress, and we declare war on Germany, and so we enter the war, um, which means that our, our third regiment, our, our Company G, uh, you know, gets mobilized as part of the National Guard and reports for duty, and they get pulled into um, the new army, the new uh, sort of it's being formed as part of the uh, American Expo Exhibitionary Force. Um, it's going to be a, a few months, though, before we start to see um, people from Wisconsin, you know, our, our soldiers that go over, um, to to actually land in Europe. Um, it's going to take a while. We've got to reform everything and mobilize, get all the equipment and training, um, and, then, and then actually get over there and situated. So, um, you know... In the meantime, we're, we're recruiting new people. There's a lot of volunteers that report for duty, um, seeing the opportunity. There's a lot of people that get drafted. Um, you know, it, for better or worse, uh, Marathon County is not as super excited about going to war against Germany. 
in part because of the German population here. And, and you know, in general, I think that there was a lot of um, people who didn't feel like we should be involved, but that didn't stop us from uh, being proud of the soldiers and the contributions that we were all, all sacrificing. This is one of the wars where everybody's got a pitch in for us to succeed. So, um, you know, you have that, you have, uh, you know, lots of men serving, whether as part of the, the, the military, you know, going, actually going and joining up or, you know, in other groups like the, the state guard, which gets formed sort of a military group, uh, the national guard for the not national guard when, cause the national guard is over in France. So while all this is happening, while we start to mobilize, we start to recruit and, you know, start buying war bonds and all that fun stuff, um, here in central Wisconsin, we, we want to be proud of, you know, our soldiers and recognize their contribution, but they haven't actually done anything yet. But, or have they? Because uh, here in the Daily Herald uh, from 1917, um, very proudly talking about Bennett A. Malter, um, who was already fighting in France. He's, he's flying a plane in France. And um, I know it's not the best, best picture here. It's a, it's a scan of a microfilm, but there he is on the right, um, and he is already flying, so we can be proud of having him. So let's let's talk about it. Where does where does Bennett Moulter enter the picture? Who is he? Well, his father, Nicholas Moulter, um, originally the family is from the Chicago area in Illinois. But in, in around 1908, I think it is, uh, Nicholas Moulter uh, brings the family up to Wausau. Um, he had some family interests in the plumbing and heating company here. He ends up taking it over, and, and as you can see from these, um, he runs it. Um, it, until like the 1920s, I think he finally retires. Um, uh, Bennett, uh, being one of the oldest son, um, he, uh, at the age of 16 or 17, somewhere around there, um, he joins up um, with the U.S. Navy. Um, actually, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about the sources that I'm using. Because um, Bennett Moulter is certainly a figure that is, is well recognized and, and talked about. But the specifics of what he actually did during his life is not super clear. Um, I am benefited greatly from, this is a, a couple pages of timeline that was put together by uh, Bob Wiley, our local aviation expert here in the central Wisconsin area. And, and he came across the story back in the 90s or maybe even earlier, did some research. Um, uh, Mary Jane Henninga, the ex uh, executive director here at the time, wrote an article in the Herald. Um, but but uh, Bob went through and he actually you know, did his diligence and, and tried to pull together as many sources as he could to try to figure out, you know, the, the life of Bennett Moulter, which, is, as you will see, is, is pretty extensive. Um, I was thankfully, uh, Bob also, he includes some interesting stories that don't necessarily, ha like, we can't verify, but then we think might have happened. Like, he, he does a great job. He doesn't just say, well, this is what happened in 1917. Uh, he says, well, we think this is happening, or, you know, we couldn't tell. I was able to verify some of the things, some of it I could not. Um, but it, it just kind of adds to the, the the mystery, I guess, of, of Bennett Mulder. Because he does go off into the military um, at the age of 16 or 17. Again, that's why it's kind of vague here. Uh, but he joins up with the U.S. Navy, um, and he serves as part of the USS Maryland, um, which we, we pretty well know that this is where he was. And this is in the Pacific Fleet, so he's steaming around the Pacific Ocean, um, uh, there's some uncertainty exactly what happened, but, uh, it said that he, he maybe was quarantined with, uh, smallpox in Manila for a little while. Uh, you know, he, he spent some time in Australia and, and, uh, the Philippines. And, um, after four years, he gets out, comes back to the States, stateside. Um, and he, he spends about a year, um, I think this is around 1911, um, spends about a year in, in, you know, the Midwest again, before going out West to California, where he is going to get involved uh, in the the new industry of the moving pictures. And in fact, he, he does have some success here. Um, this is a 1913 film uh, called A Hero's Reward, and that is Moulter um, as Willie DeWitt. Um, and this is the this is the only still frame that I can find. I can't find any, like, this hasn't been digitized and thrown up there anywhere. Um, I can't really find any of his acting in, in action. Uh, but these would have been pretty short films. Um, and I believe from the synopsis that I get, he's kind of the straight man antagonist here um, to the, the more comical chief here. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so he sees some experience. He acts in a couple movies. Uh, he starts to direct. Um, he's often assistant director um, working his way up. Um, he's working with uh, Henry Otto. Uh, certainly by like 1915, this is his partnership. Uh, Otto is a more successful um, 
or you know established director and so often the assistant director working with him is um is Bennett Moulter. now they work for the american film company uh which is one of the it, it changes its names as, as as a lot of stuff does back then um but, but anyway, American Film Company. And I'm not sure, again, this is where we get into conflicting reports of what exactly is going on, you know. But we know is that by the end of 1915, the two of them, Otto and Moulter, are in New York or on the East Coast, and they're trying to find a ship to uh, get them to France. The war has been raging at this point. World War I has kicked off uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a, it's, it's you know, gotten to the, the phase where we're digging trenches and it's going to be sort of a long haul here. And their intention is to go over and, and, and either to take film so that they can get like newsreel type stuff to kind of integrate or whatever. Um, and later there's a suggestion that maybe they went to just try to see what was the, you know, things were like so that they could replicate it and kind of do some war films back in the States. Um, but unfortunately, they're unable to really get any access. Um, again, there's a, there's a story here uh, that I couldn't verify necessarily, but apparently Otto was was denied uh, travel to to France because of his German uh, heritage, his German surname. Um, and Molter, should be said, is also German descended. His, his grandparents came from the German speaking parts of Europe. So um, there's that. Who knows if that's true? Um, I certainly wouldn't doubt it. They also didn't necessarily need to use that justification. They could just say, no, we don't want American filmmakers coming and taking film of our, our experience here. Um, at any rate, they don't give up. Uh, by early 1916, the reports are, you know, newspaper articles say that they're still in um, in, in New York, in, in the area there, trying to get abroad. Um, in the middle of the year, they take some time. Uh, Moulter visits uh, his uh, family here in Wausau. Um, they're also apparently developing a film uh, with with a, one of the stars at the time, King Baggett, uh, who's, you know, star. He was attached, apparently. I, I don't think it ever happened, but at least they were, you know, maybe developing something as well. Uh, but ultimately, by the end of, of 1916, towards, the, like, the fall, um, uh, I think Otto doesn't end up going, but uh, Bennett gets approval to go to France. And so he goes, and, and it says, uh, you know, the, initially the, the, what, he, what he's doing is, is twofold. He's going to go and be an ambulance driver as a part of a volunteer American force. Um, and then he's going to try to fly some airplanes. He's going to spend four months ambulance driving, four months in the air, and he's going to come back and make some films. It doesn't end up happening that way, but, you know, hey. The American Field, or American Ambulance Field Service, or Field, uh, yeah, Field Service, was established by some Americans who were living in Paris at the time, at the very beginning of the war, when the Germans were very close to taking Paris before the Russians ended up mobilizing and kind of pulling that back and, and all of that. I don't necessarily, we, didn't, we don't need to get into the, the long and complicated history of the World War, uh, but, but certainly there was a period where France you know, may have felt uh, uh, fallen, um, it was very close, like there was fighting outside a couple, couple uh, miles outside of Paris, and there's a colony of Americans living there, whether they were there for business or education or, you know, just wanted to get away, expatriates. Um, and they, they wanted to help their adopted, um, you know, um, countrymen, you know, not a, maybe not countrymen, um, their hosts, right? So, uh, but America is neutral. So instead, um, they're not going to like fight. They're not picking up guns. Although I, I guess maybe some of them join the Foreign Legion or, or you know, the equivalents or whatever. But um, instead, they try to offer their services as ambulance drivers to remove the, the wounded from the front lines. As the front lines get pushed back, the Germans, you know, withdraw to a more defensible position further away from Paris. Uh, they follow and end up getting kind of integrated as part of the French military effort, the war effort. Um, as a formalized group. And so this is what started as sort of a, a bunch of Americans living in Paris. Um, it also becomes sort of a, a large recruiting point. A lot of Americans come over and want to help out the French and the British um, against the German imperialism. Uh, and this is one way that they can do that. Now, it is sort of an altruistic humanitarian thing that they're doing here, though, right? Less so with what happens after De Dr. Edmund Gross gets involved. He's an American in, in Europe. And he really, really wants to see Americans come in on the side of the Allies. And so he wants to kind of move that forward and also, you know, provide a service. So he starts to organize and they end up, uh, he's, he's the organizer, one of the, the main figures organizing what becomes known as the um, Escadrille Lafayette, or the Lafayette Squadron. And this is a group of Americans 
who are flying in a dedicated core, uh, you know, airplane uh, um, core, I guess, within the French army um, and, and as volunteers, right? Um, and this is very successful. And part of the idea, again, going back to Dr. Gross's I idea here, he, he'd love to see um, this, this deepen uh, the, the American involvement because if we're flying planes, you know, not officially, but, you know, um, maybe there's something that can be done with that. Uh, he recruits very heavily from the ambulance drivers. So, um, you know, this is where we see this happen. Um, the name Lafayette, by the way, if, if you're not, if it doesn't ring a bell for you, um, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, going back to the Revolutionary War when the United States got its independence from Britain, um, he's a French uh, uh, person who comes over, uh, not person, figure, uh, a, a tremendous figure in a lot of ways, an interesting character in 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 a lot of in the French Revolution and the American Revolution and all that sort of stuff. He comes over and and helps uh, you know General Washington whip this Continental Army into a fighting shape, um, and it, you know it kind of represents and embodies the the French support of the Americans, and it, and ever since it has has been uh, his name has been attached to. Um, you know, the, the relationship that, that we have. And, and so just like Lafayette came over and helped us Americans during our time of need, now that the French need our help, you know, we're going we're gonna to fly for them. And that's kind of the, the justification here. Um, and yeah, uh, Bennett Moulter does indeed join. This is March um, 1917, um, and there is Bennett right there. And again, this is this is a, a month before um, the United States even gets involved formally. So he's flying uh, air missions for the French as an American um, at this point in time. And I don't know if at this point he was expecting to then, you know, serve for a couple more months and then go and bake pictures, or he understood that Americans would be coming and getting involved soon. Um, either way, uh, he flew. So what is he flying? What, what is air combat? Um, what he, the, the majority of what he seems to have done is take pictures as part of the reconnaissance efforts. Um, very early in World War, and actually here we can, can show, I think this is the kind of plane that he would have, would have actually been flying. I don't know 100% because it's, it's, it's kind of hard to sort through and he doesn't explicitly say, oh, I was, you know, doing a, a SPAD Mark, Mark 15 or whatever. But um, this is the style of, of, of French plane um, and they would have flown, um, it's a two-seater, so there would have been uh, uh, someone that's a pilot and then somebody who would be taking pictures as you flew over, which just brings us back to this. Um, it, early on in the First World War, you know, airplanes are brand new pretty much, right? So they didn't really know how to use them, but they understood that there's a, there's sort of a precedence here of reconnaissance and sort of intelligence gathering. You know, as, as early as the, the 1860s, the, in the American Civil War, people were using hot air balloons to, to use a platform to kind of see over the lines and see where your enemy's, you know, getting ready or weak points or, you know, whatever. Um, kind of fills the role of cavalry in a sense. Uh, you know, when, when the, the belligerents of the war end up digging in and you have these trenches that extend forever and it's, it's very difficult to move around, you can't just send some cavalry over the hill to flank them and just see, you know, where we should attack. So instead, you, you, you send them over in the air. Um, and so you have planes that are going over. Uh, you know, eventually you see cameras being attached and so you fly as high as you can, higher than, you know, so there's this arms race that happens because, you know, as the, the, the French are flying over uh, the, the trenches to see where the, the Germans are doing, you know, here's a German plane coming over. And so, you know, it doesn't take long for them to, you know, carry a revolver or a shotgun and see if they can, you know, shoot at each other in the air. Or... As you're flying over the German lines, maybe you take out a, you know, a couple grenades and just kind of toss them down, see if you can hit anybody. And then, you know, as time goes on, there are planes that are sort of designed to shoot down other planes. And then, you know, planes like this, you know, the double seater, often there would be a gunner to kind of fend them off, you know, anti-aircraft fire, you got to get higher and higher to see if you can get away from that. Um, it's, it's really, you know, this is where aircraft combat really gets developed. Um, and it's also very difficult and, and dangerous. Um, just to give you a sense of this um, and how important th this was, uh, France. At the beginning of the war, they had less than 130, 140 uh, airplanes in the entirety of their military. By the end of the war in 1918, they will have produced 68,000 airplanes. Um, so that's a lot. And then also another interesting statistic here is that of those 68,000, 52,000 would be shot down in battle, which means that there's a loss rate of 77%. Um, these planes are not sturdy. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of danger here. Um, it's, it's new. Um, and, and it, it definitely was a harrowing experience. And, and so not just anybody could just go up and, and fly planes like this. So that brings us back to, um, you know, the Americans here. Um, this is one of the reasons that, it, you know, it, it helps to have some expertise uh, here. Uh, after the, the United States gets involved in April of 1917, um, here's, here's Bennett Moulter here again. Now, now we can fly the flag proudly. Um, and I should also say, sometimes you see the, the name separated to La Fayette Esquadrilla or Squadron. Um, the reason for that is sometimes, again, I don't know if this is actually true or not, but it apparently was a way of uh, kind of saying to the Germans who objected to Americans flying, uh, no, 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 they're not, this isn't Lafayette, it's, it's the Fayette Squadron. <laughs> totally different. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, don't have to hide it after 1917 in the April. The uh, United States is involved, flying the flag, flag proudly. Eventually, as the United States, uh, the, the, the expeditionary force arrives and starts taking its place on the lines, um, it's the Lafayette uh, squadron, uh, which actually is bigger than this specific squadron. Um, there's, there's sort of the core group that started it, and then there was a large number of Americans who were flying, um, not just for the French, actually even more for the British and Italians, um, but it's kind of a general name. Anyway. After the United States gets involved, they get transferred to be the eyes and the reconnaissance of the new American forces. Um, but but um, actually, before that, uh, before around the time that the the you know troops are starting to arrive in Europe in in, in the summer of 1917, um, Bennett Moulter is sent on a mission to drop propaganda, which is another thing they would do. They'd fly over the trenches and drop leaflets and you know propaganda to the Germans. So he, he goes on this mission, he comes back on his way back, he's at uh, 12,000 feet when he said his engine quit cold, which meant it stalled out. And so he falls 12,000 feet, I, and who knows, I don't think that they had great uh, measuring, um, you know, to, uh, equipment to measure how high they were, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a fall. Um, and he survives this, um, although... Um, not not without. Apparently, he had a steel helmet that he credited with saving his life. Uh, he gets thrown from the, the 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 wreckage and is buried under some stuff. Goes unconscious. He can't get himself out. But some some uh, French troops find him and and you know take him to a hospital where he spends two days and then is discharged. Which it's crazy. Two days. Uh, but yeah, he he does. Uh, this is this is him from a newspaper uh, after his accident. Um, so he, he doesn't immediately jump back in a new plane again. Instead, he, he ends up coming back to the United States for some leave. Um, and this is, these are pictures of him in Wausau. I'm, I'm almost positive. I, I think with his father, this is, this is Nicholas, um, and maybe some siblings. I don't, I don't know exactly who everybody is, but, um, uh, this is from a scrapbook that we have that his mother put together. Um, so he comes back, visits some family. Um, gets to work doing some important work for the war effort. Uh, namely, he writes some some articles kind of explaining what it's like. Um, and and then he gets put to work um, by the 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 army. Um, he had been discharged while while he was on on leave, discharged from the French military and given the rank of first lieutenant in the U.S. Aviation Section of the Signal Corps, U.S. Army. Because, of course, they didn't really have a, an Air Force yet. This is still pretty new. Uh, but he's put to work then in, in building the Air Force. He sent, goes to a couple different training fields, uh, first to Gertzner Field in Louisiana, uh, where, by the way, he's going to meet his future wife uh, while, while stationed, stationed there, uh, Mona uh, Pujol, 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 P-U-J-O, um, actually the daughter of a former Louisiana uh, congressman, so uh, certainly not uh, well, an, an important family there. Anyway, um, from there, he goes to California for Rockwell Field, um, and he actually is involved in the formulating and, and, and basically writing the curriculum for the advanced flying school. Um, and then finally, he ends up going, uh, getting the rank of captain, and he has a position at Wilbur Wright Field in Ohio. Um, and that's kind of his, his war experience. Um, again, in 1919, he ends up getting married, um, and they spend the first year of their life traveling around Latin America. Um, in, in Central and South America uh, for the uh, Page Detroit Motor Company. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this because he's got quite the active life. He, he gets involved in business. He goes, um, you know, comes back to the United States. He's in New York City. He gets involved in finance. Uh, maybe, maybe went to school for a little bit and got a, a degree in economics and business administration. Um, back in New, New Orleans, he gets involved as, as, in companies. Um, he's also involved in the Army Air Corps. 
Um, so he he has a, a position there in the reserve, obviously. Um, and so he has some appointments there. Um, I think generally by the by the, the the start of World War II, he is largely considered to be a businessman because um, he was, you know. Uh, during World War II, he again joins up. Um, he is put in charge of the 99th Air Base Group in um, in Florida, and then they move to Trinidad not long after that. I'd, and then and then he spends some time in in England, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, not not necessarily guy in charge, but he's an important figure in the logistics and kind of the the. Uh, supplying the airmen and air bases. Um, this picture, by the way, here is is kind of a conference, um, and he is, you know, represents England, um, the only European camp, you know, uh, theater representative of the sort of air forces uh, discussion here. So he he was certainly an important figure, um, you know, good friends with Dwight Eisenhower apparently, um, and and other leading uh, military people at the time. But in after the war, 1946, uh, he starts to have some health problems, um, which eventually leads, unfortunately, to his his death in 1950, um, and he leaves an interesting legacy. Now, now that we've kind of gone through the story, I should go back to this, because I, I have to admit, um, this is not actually very, there's a problem with this. Because the thing is, he actually, as far as I can tell, never lived in Wausau. Um, if, if you were keeping track of the dates, you might have noted that his family moved here in 1908 from Chicago. He, at the age of 16, um, his four-year uh, tenure in the Navy starts in 1906. So he actually is not even part of that move. Um, he may have spent some time, you know, maybe a couple days or, or weeks in, in the military, in, in Wausau visiting family over the years, but he never really spent time here. Um, and and it's, this is this is shown here. There's other newspaper articles that are on the same time. Um, you know, he lives in Los Angeles when he leaves, so they claim him as an Angelino from California. Um, in Chicago, in the Chicago region, um, they claim him too because hey, he graduated high school here, so he's he's one of us. Um, which I think is kind of interesting, and I think it also speaks to the the, the situation at, in World War One. You know, where everybody's very excited to to show that we are doing our part, um, and just because he doesn't actually live in 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 central Wisconsin or you know hasn't lived in Chicago for for better part of a decade, doesn't mean that we can't claim him. And and so it's I think it's still worth telling the story, and it's still interesting, um, nonetheless. And so hopefully you don't mind my um, uh, obscuring of the truth there for a little while. Um, I didn't want to let that get in the way of a good story. So. That concludes Bennett Moulter's story. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll check that in a second. But in the meantime, I want to tell you about some stuff that we're, we're doing the rest of this month, because we are continuing to talk about some important veterans. Uh, Moulter may not have lived in Wausau um, and Marathon County, but um, this weekend we're going to be talking about Scott Elwin, um, who was a definitely a local here, uh, you know, from from enlisted and 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 another pilot of of note, uh, but this time. You know, a few few decades later into the Vietnam era, so uh, his his sister Pamela Fullerton uh, will be joining us to tell us about her her late brother and his legacy. Um, it's a really interesting story. Um, I'm I'm really excited. I hope you will join us for that. This is that's this Saturday at two p.m. Um, and yeah, same same place you're watching this right here. Um, and then of course we're going to continue for next week for history chats uh, with another local, uh, Bill Hayes was a soldier um uh they, but at the beginning of world war ii he was working in the newspaper or the the wallpaper department of sears and wassa and he's going to become uh, you know join up join with the 101st airborne and is going to be pictured here in one of the most iconic pictures of the 20th century so um you have to tune in next week at 12 30 to hear about that and uh, and and i'll give you a little little taste uh you ever wondered what is actually being said in this moment that the picture has been taken? Well, Bill was there and he he told his story. So you come back for that and you can find out what they were what they were talking about, um, what what Eisenhower was was telling his his uh, the the troops here. So anyway, I think that's probably good. Um, I'm going to just quick go back. There we go. I'm gonna check check just to see if anybody has any questions or or comments. Uh, certainly excited, you know, about uh, Malter or um, 
you know, anything else, I guess. So bear with me here as I navigate. All right, Facebook, that's not very helpful. Let's try this again. Um, did he have any children? Um, interesting question. Uh, yeah, he did. Um, I think he had two children. Um, I didn't... Hmm. I didn't really dig too deeply into the uh, his 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 joke. I kind of kind of kept the story specifically at um, you know his World War One experience and a little bit of of a, of a, of a, of a it, I didn't track it down too much further. But um, yes, he did have two children, um, and I you know they lived a happy life um, in out of New Orleans, I believe. Um, I certainly saw his son, you know. Uh, was named Bennett uh, Moulter Jr. and he, he pops up occasionally when I was doing research. So, yeah. Cool. Well, I think that that is the questions that we've received. Um, thanks again for watching. And I uh, hope you, you continue to tune in this month for some, some interesting military and military-related stories, including, um, you know, another notable airman this weekend. So, um, thanks for watching. Um, we will see you next time and have a wonderful week um, and